If you have your Bibles, if you would open them up to 2 Chronicles 28. We have been working through a series entitled Moving Forward. And we've been talking about different things that would hold us captive, that would enslave us, whether those things are fear and sin, whether it is indecision that we talked about this past week. We continue to move forward as we go through this series looking at elements that hit us all. In so many ways, we are affected by different things just because we are Indeed, human beings facing life. This morning, we're going to look at adversity. Adversity. Adversity is something that hits us all. I think this is one reason, I'll do the quick shout out to the moms, that God gives us moms. If you have ever been the child who decided to ride their bike just a little too fast around the corner, or face that, that rejection from that girl when you thought you had finally gotten up enough muster to go and ask her on that date. Or whether something hasn't happened the way you wanted it to happen. I've been very grateful for the role that my mom has played in loving me um, and helping me through those times and reminding me at least she loves me. And that my God does too. But everyone in here can relate to adversity. It is something that does indeed hit us all. What we do with it, though, is what becomes important. What we do in it makes all the difference. And it can either reveal Christ to the world and ourselves, or in turn can end up looking like denial of Christ and his sufficiency, just like the world would. Jesus even said to his disciples at the very end of his earthly ministry, in this world you're going to have trouble, you're going to have tribulation. But then he goes on to add, but be of good courage because I have overcome the world. I looked up the definition for adversity. The word means difficulties and misfortune. If you look at the Greek word that's used here for tribulation or for adversity, it can be anything that inflicts distress, oppression, affliction, or tribulation. So it's not necessarily something um, that is bad or uh, as a result of something that you have done. It could be any kind of distress or any kind of pain or any kind of thing that you might face. So it could be, uh, it was, it's used for childbearing. In scriptures, it's used for by Paul for wrongful imprisonment. It's used for proper punishment, i.e., the great tribulation on the day of the Lord. It is used for affliction uh, for following Christ. It is used really all different kinds of way, and the context kind of gives you an understanding of what the tribulation is. But I want to remind us of one thing before we dive in and read, and that is this. I need you to remember that every adversity that we face is either a direct or indirect result of sin. And I, the reason I want to say that is just to remind us of something. Whether, whether it's a result of a cursed world in which we live, whether it's a part of a, a sin-affected humanity of which we find ourselves a part, whether it's a part of sin's marred mark on us personally, whether that's physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, or even if it's a part and a result of a spiritual warfare that stems from even angelic rebellion. Adversity finds its root in sin. And we one day will have a Revelation 21 moment where there will be no more tear. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more weeping, no more sickness, no more pain. But until that day... We have everything from personal bankruptcy to a disease. We have the consequences of moral failure versus a tornado that might sweep through your town. Some adversities seem to exhibit a, a causal link. We can trace it back to this or that, but some adversities seem to have no rhyme or reason at all to them, and they appear to us very random, meaningless, and even haphazard. 
And so we had this big, huge genre of adversity. And how are we as Christians to deal with it? And how are we through a COVID-19 year and reality move forward? And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And I want to do it by doing a case study of what not to do. Kind of with the theme of the mothers, uh, what you'll never hear your mothers say. I also want you to be encouraged not to do whatever I read um, but that this man in this book did uh, because he has given us as a point of instruction of what not to do. And so if you have your place, 2 Chronicles 28, we're going to read the first eight verses, then I'm going to skip down to 16 and finish the chapter. If you would stand as we read God's word together. King Ahaz, we're in the southern kingdom Things were going pretty well. Jotham was the king before him, his father. If you look back in verse 6 of chapter 27, which, by the way, is a very short chapter, only nine verses. It says, Jotham became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord his God. So there's great success that he was having. Chapter 28. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do right in the sight of the Lord, as David his father had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He also made molten images for the Baals. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of Ben-Hinnom and burned his sons in fire. This is why I say don't do these things, by the way. Just reiterating. According to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense on every high place, on the hills and under every green tree. Wherefore, the Lord his God delivered him into the hands of the king of Aram. And they defeated him and carried away from him a great number of captives and brought them to Damascus. He also was delivered into the hands of the king of Israel, who inflicted him with heavy casualties. For Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And Zitri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Maseah, the king's son, and Azrikam, the ruler of the house, and Elkanah, the second to the king. And the sons of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women and sons and daughters. And they took also a great deal of spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. Now, just to give you an understanding, 9 through 15 is dealing with what happens when they take that back to Israel. Israel goes, dude, don't bring this back here. These were our brothers. Send them back home. Okay, so that's the, it's kind of a side story there. But I want to get back to Ahaz and what Ahaz continues to do. So skip to verse 16. And so at that time, King Ahaz sent to the king of, kings of Assyria for help. For again, the Edomites had come and attacked Judah and carried away captives. I'm just wondering how many people are left. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the lowlands and of the Negev of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh, Ahijalon, Geradoth, Geradoth, there we go, and Sako with its villages, Timna and its villages, and Gimzo and its villages. And they settled there. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, the king of Israel. For he had brought about a lack of restraint in Judah and was very unfaithful to the Lord. And so Tilgath Pilneser, the king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. Although Ahaz had took a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the palace of the king and of the princes and gave it to the king of Assyria, it did not help him. Now in the time of his distress, this same king Ahaz became yet more unfaithful to the Lord. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, and said, because the gods of the kings of Aram helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they became the downfall of him and all Israel. Moreover, when Ahaz gathered together the utensils of the house of God, he cut the utensils of the house of God in pieces. And he closed the doors of the house of the Lord. What a huge moment right there. 
and made the altars for himself in every corner of Jerusalem. In every city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense to other gods and provoked the Lord, the God of his fathers, to anger. Now the rest of his acts and all his ways, from first to last, behold, they are written in the books of the kings of Judah and Israel. So Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of Jerusalem, for they did not bring him into the tomb of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. Will you pray with me? Father, I ask that you would help us this morning as we think about adversity and how we respond and how we move forward, that we would take counsel from your word. Lord, there are times where we are spurred forward by positive example, or exactly what we prayed for for the families dedicating these young children this morning. That by their positive example, these children would come to know you and to walk with you. And Lord, there are times where we learn by negative example. Where we see things happen and we see the results of those things. And without having to experience them ourselves, we learn. And I pray this morning would be an opportunity for that in our lives. That we would think about the things that this king has done and we would see the consequences and we would learn from your word i pray that you would teach us in jesus name amen ahaz the king chapter 28 chronicles his life we get from beginning to end one man's life in a chapter think about that for just a moment We read these chapters in our Bibles, and we don't realize that this is a man's lifetime. We read it as one chapter, and we move on to the next chapter. But these are things that were then written down about this man. This man is following a king, and he chooses to be the king that he's going to be in response to what he's sat under. And here is something that I want to say um, as we start this, as we look at his life. Every person chooses whom he or she or they are going to be and how they are going to be. Now, that doesn't mean from a physical standpoint, whether it's this struggle that Tabitha is having, or it doesn't necessarily mean from all of the externals that they cannot govern. But as we think about it, we live in a culture that loves to blame everyone else for everything that's wrong in their life. This is not new, though, because we've read the beginning of this book. And in the Garden of Eden, what did man do when God said, what have you done? He looked at her and said, it was the woman that you gave me. She was the one, Lord. So from the very beginning, we've looked for someone typically to blame. But here's the thing. Reality is we are born into certain situations and certain circumstances in life. We're born with certain things about who we are, our physical bodies, whatever it happens to be. And so the culture and the context in which we're born doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to be different and to live above and beyond the things that we are naturally around. So much is ingrained in us from our parents and from our cultures. And so we have to recognize that that is true. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. It's a a parable, it's a proverb, but it's not a guarantee. But it also works both ways. It can go for good or for evil. But just because that is out there doesn't, Guarantee. I would love to know that it guarantees it, but it doesn't. At some point, every person chooses who they're going to be like. And Ahaz, after his father Jotham, decides he's going to follow a different path. Every one of us in life gets to choose a path. We're part of the choices and the makeup and the context of the things that we have experience and the ways that we have responded. Ahaz rejects the way of David and his father, and instead it says he lives like everyone else around him, even going and doing some crazy things like putting his son through the fire and having all of these places where he could burn these incense. Now, here's the thing. We don't get a backstory. We don't get to know why he made that decision. You would think 
with Jotham as your father, following the Lord, doing all of these things, what went wrong? It's like Samuel when he was, or Eli, when he was a, a prophet, or not a prophet, but a priest, and his two sons, off the deep end, and the way that they responded and lived out their lives, we don't get the reason, which means we don't get to blame anyone. This is Ahaz. This is a choice that Ahaz has made. I think I'm, I'm kind of glad that we don't get a, a reason, because we like to come up with reasons so often, because it can shift the responsibility and the accountability for that. And so as we want to move forward, we have to recognize that we are a product of choices and decisions that we have made and that we are continuing to make. Man, I'm so glad that we have mercies are new every day and we can start that journey again. But we have to recognize we choose each day whom we will serve. As for me and my house, who are we going to serve? The Lord? Next thing I want you to see from Ahaz's story is too often we are the reason for our adversity. Now, I have preached on suffering, 1 Peter, we went through it, and 1 Peter talks a lot about it. And these are things that you can't control. And so I wanted to take a little different spin this morning, just talk about sometimes the things that we could have controlled a little better. Too often, the reality is we are the reason of our own adversity. We often invite or create the opportunities for adversity to come into our lives. We sin. We blow it. And then that sin invites death and chaos and turmoil into our experience. Adversity can be the chastening of God. But it can also just be the natural consequences of our actions and the actions of others. Colossians 3.25 is exactly what Paul writes about when he says, you bear the consequences, and that without partiality. There's, there's something about the fact that if you do this, this happens. If you do that, that happens. There are ways that we are wired to understand how the world works. We expect them to work that way, as a matter of fact. We bank on the fact that there's causality. And so when we have adversity strike us, sometimes we need to take a step back and allow that moment to speak to us and say, okay, Why? What is the cause? What are the things that are happening? So think about it for just a a second. Think back on some of the adversities that you've faced in the past. In some of those cases, can you see how you played a role to some degree in the challenges that you faced? Whether it was financial difficulties, maybe it was marital struggles, maybe it was poor grades in school conflict between friends, a failed business attempt. You can look back and you can see how, man, some of the things that I did weren't wise choices and they ended up giving me adversity. There's enough that we don't control. And my encouragement is that we need to limit what we do cause. There are some that you might have in your mind that come to your mind that just seem to love adversity. Love challenge. I was talking to a gentleman uh, this past week. He works for the Baptist Children's Home. I believe it's in Virginia. And he talked about the fact that as he works with these students, that they don't know what to do with success. And they just keep shooting themselves over and over in the foot when they get some success because they've only known adversity and struggle and chaos And so they're comfortable in chaos. And so they just end up, when they get success, they just end up blowing it. And so his job, part of his job, is to help them get through that so they create a, they can unlearn bad habits and they can relearn good habits so they can be successful in life. This passage, it says, because of the way that Ahaz chose to be in verses 1 through 4, verse 5 starts with, therefore, wherefore God then gave him over. This has a ringing tone of of Romans chapter 1. Because man chose this, God gave them over. Because man chose that, God gave them over. And he allows them to go and to have these adversities to see. And so in this case, it says he gave them over to Aram and to Israel. 
even allowing his own son to be killed, his head servant to be killed, and the second to the king to be killed. Verse 6 states it clear. It says, God was doing this because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And then it continues, verse 17 and 18, you see God continues to give them over. Edom and the Philistines revolt. I mean, you think about this. Jotham has things under control. People are paying tribute to Israel. The land is settled. And here is someone walking away from the Lord. And you just start to see all the spinning plates teetering all around him. You see it hit after hit after hit. Everything starts to kind of erupt. You ever been there? Where one adversity, then another one, and then it's like, you're like, is everything going to be on fire at the same time? Why not? This is kind of what's happening to this man. It's like he thinks, oh, I've got a problem over here. Wait a minute, I've got a problem up there. Oh, you mean in the north I've got this problem? Oh, you're attacking in the south. How do I handle this? And we get an answer, and it's not really good. Verse 16, King Ahaz sent to the king of Assyria for help. Too often, our first attempts to overcome adversity is grasping at straws. When we want to get out of something, we get in a panic, and we start trying to figure out the best way we know how. We don't turn to the Lord. We turn to X, Y, or Z. And we see, how do I get out of this? This makes the most sense to me. This person could do this. That thing could do that. I turn to those things first. You know, the grasping at straws, the, if you know where that comes from, um, I did a little research because sometimes I like to know where little phrases come from. It came from a, a, a proverb in a novel in 1748 by Samuel Richardson. And he wrote this, a drowning man will catch at a straw, the proverb well says. The straw in this case refers to a sort of thin reed that would grow along the side of a river, which a drowning man being swept away by a fast current might desperately grasp in a futile attempt to save himself. Thus, grasping at straws has ever since been taken to mean to make a desperate and almost certain futile effort to save one's self. You're grasping at straws. It is that last or that, that ditch effort that you're trying to be able to take care of yourselves. It's taking matters into your own hands and doing whatever you can to fix your situation. Here we have Ahaz, and he reaches out to Assyria in verses 16 through 18. He sends in verse 16 for help because all these people are coming. If you go over to 2 Kings chapter 16, you have the same story. If you know anything about the, the kings and the chronicles, they tell the same stories, just a little bit different slant. They include something over here, or this one knows the other one's written, so he doesn't say it, and he adds another piece to it. Based on 2 Kings 16, it shows him that um, Syria does indeed come and, in fact, kills the king of Aram for him. But in so doing, it then cost him a lot, and it actually created a new problem for him, the Assyrians. They began to, instead of strengthening him and helping him anymore, they then said, we did this for you, now you're under our control. And so even giving them all of the loot that he could give them, it did not work for him. And so it says at the end of verse 21... It did not help him, did not free him from this newfound rule that they were under. It was rubbing off on all the kingdom, too. And one of the scariest verses, verse 19. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, the king of Israel. For he had brought about a lack of restraint in the people. And they were very unfaithful to the Lord. One of the things about adversity and the way that we respond teaches others how to live and how to respond. Ahaz's life wasn't just being lived out by himself. The way he was going about what he was doing, setting up these extra places to worship, taking down these correct ways of worship, 
was leading everyone else to go and to do all the things that they were doing as well. And so God then allows Assyria to come against them instead of aiding him. Next thing I want you to see is this. Adversity doesn't necessarily push you towards God. I would say this. Adversity actually exposes our ingrained tendencies. You've ever heard what what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? I think so often that line is actually what doesn't kill you makes you um, not just stronger, but maybe more calloused, maybe more stubborn. Because you have a choice in how you're going to respond to what you respond to. And so in verse 22, you have this incredible picture. It says, in his time of distress, this king Ahaz became yet more unfaithful to the Lord. You can relate to this. Adversity does a lot of things. It can build strength. It can redefine your perspective and your behavior. It can focus your priorities. It can expose your character. It can make tendencies that you have become ingrained habits. But in all of those, it can do those towards God and towards godliness or away from God and towards other means. That's what adversity can do. It's a, it's a critical crisis of belief kind of moment. And we still have the choice to go one way or the other. And as we walk those paths, they become more and more divergent and we become more and more set in the way that we will live out our lives facing facing whatever we have. For Ahaz, it doesn't come and do a positive work in here. In fact, look at verse 23 again. It It says he copies the altar of Damascus. Why? Because Aram had come and beat him. And so he figured, well, that God must have beat our God. So all replicated. And so in If you go back in the King's Version, it says in that King's Version that he sent back the design of the altar to his head kind of uh, priest so that he could make that altar so that when he got home, he could burn incense to it. He was so excited about finding some opportunity to get out of the trouble that he was in. He sent ahead. He had gone to Damascus to, to see that king of Assyria to try to make amends with him. And here's the craziness. Like, The Assyrians had come in and beaten Aram. So I don't understand. Why don't you just go with this? this, I mean, if you're going to pick somebody else's gods, pick the Assyrians' gods because that one would have been the one. But he's just anything, grasping at straws. We might look at him and go, well, that's dumb. That was silly. How many times have we done something just as stupid when we look back? In the moment, we're, we're just trying to do something. And here this man is left the Lord. Verse 24, ultimately he closes the doors on the house of the Lord. Wow. At some point, if we continue to choose to go our own path and to do it our own way, that's exactly what happens in our own hearts. Adversity hardens us. And as we continue to walk away, we basically shut the door to the Lord. We no longer seek Him. We no longer go to Him. We no longer believe in His power to do anything for us or on our behalf. And so this is where this man has been left by the end of it all. A man who has closed the door, not just for himself, but for a nation those that would follow after him. And instead, he goes and he builds all these other places where he can burn incense to the many other gods, verse 25, drawing more and more anger from the Lord. And then that's how it ends. He doesn't have a moment of revival. He dies. And they don't even bury him with the other kings. They bury him in the city but not with the kings. They look at his dad and they say, you don't get to be buried next to your dad. We see what this happened, what or this led us. And he has taken that honor from him. Now, that was 
that was a passage in this past week's Bible reading for me. It was earlier in the week, and when I hit it, I was like, that's where I'm going to be this week. Because I saw someone who just saw adversity and did everything he could in his human power to try to do it his own way. And he sought anything and everything. He rejected, walked away from things. We don't know all the reasons behind it, but we see the outcome of it. We see a nation that was moving forward, that was secure, now in shambles, having their people taken captive in this direction, that direction, this direction, and that direction. And we can relate in our lives sometimes to something like this. Where things may have been so together and then, man, we just watch it unravel. I, I don't want to be King Ahaz. I don't want to raise my children with that kind of perspective. I never want to close the door on the Lord's house. But I have to be careful to recognize that I'm looking at a man's life in one chapter. And so we're getting these pictures, these moments in his life. And this led to a final conclusion. And it's a choice that we all have to make. And so I want to I give us some positive. So if you have your Bibles, open them over to Romans chapter 5. Because I want to show you what adversity is can do in the life of a believer when we put it in the context of the Lord. Romans 5, I'm just going to read the first five verses. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through his Holy Spirit who has been given to us. There's this picture here of of what it looks like to walk with the Lord. And I love the way that it starts. I love the way that it ends. And we see in the middle the work of God. And so I just want to pull out a couple of things in closing. First one is this. Paul writes in chapter 5, right after chapter 4, which is great, talking about faith and what does it look like, this redemption, this justification. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, and we've obtained an introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. First thing, you know your position with God in Christ. You've been justified, you have peace with God, you stand in his grace. One of the coolest things about that is it says that we've received an introduction into grace by faith. God is still at work, he is still working on us. And it's a call then to keep our eyes to the fulfillment of all of this. We exalt in hope of the glory of God. It's this forward-looking picture that we have of God in a bigger world, in a bigger system, working in a way that draws us out of our moments into eternity. Unless you're not in Christ. Because this says you're justified, you have peace with God, and you stand in grace. If you have a relationship with Christ this morning, these things are true of you. But if you do not, I want to encourage you and challenge you. I don't know what adversity you might be facing or what adversity you will soon face. But God uses those to bring about those crisis of belief moments where you have a choice to either walk towards him or to walk away from him. And this morning, if you are without Christ, I want to challenge you not to be someone who is indecisive, but to pray for the Lord to bring repentance to your heart and decisiveness to your steps that you would respond to Christ so that you could claim the same position and have these same truths poured over you. Then you go on and you start reading and you see adversity as a chance to reorient yourself to God. Notice what it says. It says, we exult in our tribulations. How do you do that? How can you say, Lord, I'm I'm okay in this moment? 
It gives us a moment to pause, all of us to pause, whether it's something that we know is a direct result of something we've done or we have no clue why it's happening. Adversity has a way of getting our attention. It's just like every funeral I've ever done. People don't like funerals. They don't like a dead body. It makes them uncomfortable. And you know what? As a pastor, I capitalize on that. It's horrible to say. But we don't stop long enough to deal with that reality. And so it's a moment for us to go, oh. And that's what an adversity is. It's a gut check moment. It's a how am I going to live? How am I going to respond? And you see this picture that Paul puts out there. And this is a man who's lived it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you, he just starts listing all the things that he's gone through and all the things that he's faced. But he says this, we, we exalt our tribulation because we know something. We know that tribulation brings about perseverance. And if we're doing that well with our eyes on the Lord, that we're walking with the Lord and our feet is strengthened and that, per, that perseverance produces proven character. That's a lot of peace. Proven character. And proven character, hope. We see this adversity, when handled well, brings about a godly endurance. And I love the idea here because what it tells me is that adversities in Jeff Smith's uh, vernacular are opportunities for God to be on display. That's what happens. When you have proven character in your life, it's kind of a Matthew 5, 16. That they will see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven the way you respond. And so God oftentimes doesn't choose to remove an adversity, but to use the adversity. Hope is not grounded on the temporary. It's based on the eternal. This is what he talks about in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For momentary light affliction, which he's just talked about. Well, he will talk about at the end of that book, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Adversities become opportunities for God to be on display in your life and to show yourself different than the world even as he's working on you to draw you into intimacy and relationship with you. And so he doesn't take away all adversity. He uses them. He uses them to bring about perseverance, to bring about proven character, and proven character hope. If you've ever met someone who's kind of walked through that trajectory, they're some of the neatest people to be around. You look at their eyes, and you can see the worn face, but you can see eyes that light up for Jesus Christ. I had a gentleman who went through much adversity, and I pray that when I get to be his age, I love Jesus half as much as he does. He, he told me, B.J., what you need is some failure in your life. I had a lot of it. And I'm like, can I just skip to the joy and the, the character and the hope that you have? Man. But God uses it. We don't sit there and say, okay, Lord, um, today could you bring upon me great adversity that I might know you better. I don't think I've ever prayed that prayer. He takes care of that for me. <laughs> he knows what I need. You've ever heard the saying, pray for patience, don't do it, right? Because all he does is give you opportunities to become a patient person, which means he gives you adversity and challenge. God, I, I want to be, be patient. And so your child comes in in the middle of you trying to pray, and you go, don't you see I'm praying? Oh, Great. One of the beautiful pictures, though, in this passage is God is with you. 
through the presence of his Holy Spirit. God doesn't remove the adversity. Instead, he puts himself into the midst of it with you. And what an incredible promise that we have. God is good and he is here with us. And then here's the great news. Because that is true, you don't have to be like whoever they are. You don't have to be like them. Do you know how chapter 28 ends? And a guy named Hezekiah, his son, becomes king after Ahaz. Do you know anything about Hezekiah? One of the greatest kings Judah ever had. Every prayer that Hezekiah asked for got answered. Even giving him more life, which probably wasn't a good idea, it turns out. When Hezekiah is faced with armies, guess what he doesn't do? He, goes, he doesn't do what his dad did. He goes and goes to the Lord, and the Lord kills 238,000 people in the nighttime on his behalf. Guess what? I don't care what you have gone through, what circumstances have surrounded you in the past, who your mom is, who your dad is, who they weren't, what adversities you have faced. The scriptures say you don't have to be like that. You can move forward with Christ, and God can do incredible things through you and with you For his glory. Every one of us have faced adversity. Some of us, we've done well at times and done horrid at others. I want to challenge you this morning to set all those aside and say, okay, Lord, how do I start today to move forward with you? And if you're in the midst of an adversity, we don't pray for it. We don't desire it. But I pray that you don't get hardened like Ahaz, and become callous and shut yourself off to the Lord, but that you would look up to the Lord and say, God, how do I, how do I live out Romans 5? How do I live out that? Help me to see it in light of that. Give me the eyes to see something bigger so that I trust you in the midst of it. And if you're not facing adversity right now, it's coming. I don't know what it looks like but I know the God who's willing to be there with you because of what Jesus Christ has done on a cross. He's proven that his love will transcend anything that you face. Will you pray with me? Father, we face adversity. We have seen it on display today. We've seen from the other side of things these Young children who don't even have a clue what adversity looks like. They're just living. Committing ourselves to teaching them truth. We have no idea what their journeys have in store. We don't have a clue what this next week looks like for us. And though that could drive us to fear of the unknown Yet we have you. And so whether it's adversity or whether it's even success, which can prove its own adversity. God, I pray that you would help us to look not like Ahaz, but to have a life that looks like Romans chapter 5. We're reminded of who we are, what it means to be your child, that you will hold us fast. That you are our God, that you will be with us so that we would be able to say with Job, he gives and he takes away. But praise the Lord anyway. God, I ask that you would just minister to our families here today. You minister to each of us individually this morning. I don't know the adversities. And for some, it is so dark, it is so hidden and repressed because they don't want anybody else to see. 
that they feel like they're carrying this thing alone and they're living in a, in a, a world that is isolated. I pray that you would be a God who would reach down into that life and you would call them out of it. That you would not harden hearts, but that you would break them and reshape them. That you would infuse life into them because of your word and because of truth. That you would speak powerfully over the, the things of this world, the things that are thrown at us, the affections that we even carry. God, help us to move forward in your strength, to your glory. And in those moments of adversity, help us to shine like stars in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. God, may we do life differently because we know the one who holds it all and because he lives in us. Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take courage. I have overcome the world. May we let you do that in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.